Yeah, so uh, um, for uh, this um, panel, we, um, you know, our, the title of our panel does reflect um, some of the poster papers um, that um, are here this year, which talked about aesthetics. But I think uh, our panel will take a little bit more expansive view of the meaning of aesthetics, as you will um, see. So I'm going to switch back to my screen. And um, my uh, presentation um, will be on the awe and the sublime um, and how that works in the planetarium. And this is work that was inspired by James Croft, who from interviews with planetarium professionals identified the elements that he thought uh, would critically uh, define the planetarium experience. And he called these um, the aesthetics of the planetarium experience. And these include having a live presenter, being immersed, taking audiences on a journey, using music, and creating a contemplative, slow-paced experience. And I wrote about the research that supported the first four of these aesthetics in two articles, and I encourage you um, to download them and read them if you're interested. The most recent one was just published uh, the other month, but because um, I will be focusing today on only the fifth one, which is having a contemplative slow paced experience. And so the question is, why is this so critical to the planetarium? And I, along with others, think it has to do with a traditional planetarium mimicking the experience of looking up at the night sky while being in a dark, remote, quiet location. And when you have the opportunity to do that, you can contemplate the stars and contemplate the vastness of the universe. And that installs a sense of awe. And um, this also connects with the concept of the sublime. And so the sublime, if you look in the dictionary, the one that we were interested in, the definition, it's something that inspires awe, such as um, a great beauty or a nobility, or something that transcends ordinary experiences. And so um, artists and philosophers and other thinkers have argued about what the sublime means over the century. Um, some of the, um, one aspect of it is the mathematical sublime, which is being awed by enormous, enormous scales, by quantities so large that they make us feel small, so just being overwhelmed by the number of stars at the core of uh, the globular cluster here. Another type of sublime is the dynamic sublime, which is being awed by the power of nature, uh, traditionally by phenomena like rough seas or thunderstorms or volcanoes. And in, astronom in astronomical phenomena, um, you know, they typically evolve on much larger timescales than human lifespans, but I think the active sun is a good example, um, which epitomizes the dynamic sublime that we can show. And finally, even static astronomical imagery can lead to a sense of the sublime. In her 2012 book, Elizabeth Kessler tied this to the 19th century uh, American landscape painting genre. And in works like this by Albert Bierstadt, the experience of the sublime comes in part from seeing the distant mountains with their snow-capped peaks rising to merge with the clouds at the top of the, uh, the frame. And uh, in another Bierstadt painting, the sublime is in the beams of light that's shining down on the landscape with the clouds appearing to hide and otherworldly transcendent light, that light source that lies just above. And then finally, in this Thomas Moran painting, we get a sense of the awesome scale of the landscape, which has been eroded over millions of years. And that erosional force is also suggested by the dark um, storm clouds hanging off to the upper left, as well as um, the Colorado River down at the bottom. And there are similar sublime elements in astronomical images, such as this iconic image of the pillars of creation, uh, which looks geomorphological. You see um, sharp color contrast between the warm columns and the cool blue-green background. And um, if you follow the columns from the bottom to the top, they, um, you get a sense of depth. And then finally, the pillars appear to be illuminated from above, again, by a transcendent light source just out of frame. And so, we, sat, we see that the awe and the sublime can show up in the night sky in classical planetariums. It can show up in modern multi-wavelength astronomical images. And it's also in animated flights through 3D visualizations um, that make gas clouds look immense and awesome. So once we've amazed our audiences and filled them with awe, what can we do next? That's a question that I hope to answer in the very near future. And so stay tuned. All right, so with that, I'm going to stop screen share and uh, I'm going to turn it over to our next panelist, Alex.
Let me be right here. Yeah, there thank you. you. Let me get our the shared screen here. All right, hopefully that's visible. Um, all right, yeah, thanks, Kachun. Um, Yeah, so I'm gonna be just briefly going over my work uh, being done at the University of Cape Town as part of my PhD project where we're working towards characterizing the learning space of the digital dome. Uh, so a bit of background, like I mentioned, this is a PhD project and with um, in partnership with the Ziku Planetarium it has recently undergone a digital upgrade a couple of years ago. And this is a work uh, with the Physics and Astronomy Education Research Group at UCT. Um, we identify that the digital dome itself actually offers it, um, itself as a learning space, uh, as a formal learning environment for teachers and lecturers. Um, and we, we acknowledge that this new tech actually kind of needs to be more understood in order to maximize this learning impact. There's not too much work being done in this area, uh, despite the digital dome being around for a couple decades. Uh, one example is with Kachan Mew's work um, from 2017 that sees marginal learning gains in the planetarium. Um, but it's more the long-term benefits that really stand out. And uh, we're, currently we're in the exploratory phase using post-show questionnaires with the student experience. So this characterization, we kind of put into two categories. One is how engaging the planetarium is to the students and how productive uh, the learning space is to the students. Uh, the former, we, we look at through ticket box questions, address um, assessing kind of the enjoyment factor and the difficulty. And then the latter is through free response uh, uh, free responses from the students that look at uh, what stands out to them and what was actually learned in the experience. Uh, now, the first time we administered this uh, was last year when with uh, 89 introductory astronomy students at University of Cape Town that were learning about the celestial sphere from the, the course lecture, uh, where the lecturer themselves gave a, gave a um, kind of a supplementary show to the course curriculum. Uh, that was a geocentric Earth-based experience on the celestial sphere. And here you can see um, kind of uh, preliminary results uh, from those ticket box responses, looking at how engaging the show was to the students. And uh, you, a few things to note is kind of the clustering of responses at, at the high end of, of the enjoyment factor and, um, and the, the kind of the, it being a very um, understandable material for the students. So we actually rate this as an engaging show. And then we can now compare this to the kind of looking at the product, uh, how productive the show was as a learning space then to the students. Uh, for example, when we look at what the best part of the show was, a lot of students will answer, oh, that's the music, when we expect them to say, uh, if it was an engaging show, that it had something to do with the celestial sphere. So this is still ongoing, however, and we hope to see what, what comes out of this. And uh, a, few, a few weeks later, we also did a second show to a very similar cohort of students, um, now with the reduced uh, kind of number of them of 75 introductory astronomy students. And this time we actually narrowed the focus of the show down to uh, more of an allocentric space-based uh, power of 10 video uh, that was uh, conducted on, on the planetarium dome. Uh, this gave us a chance to give it, to look at an allocentric experience for the students. Um, and it was, uh, um, and this, this sh the show was actually inspired by Kacha News work uh, uh, where he also kind of, uh, him and his team actually recreated the, the powers of 10 video for the dome. And in this instance, we actually uh, recorded the seat number of the students to see what, what kind of emerges out of that as well of, uh, based on the, the viewing angle for the, the students in the planetarium. And here you can keep, see also some preliminary results uh, um, kind of where we, where we extend the ticket box uh, questions into, into looking not just if the student enjoyed the experience or not, but also giving a reason why. And then so now we look at the engaging, but we can see also kind of a spillover effect of uh, where we see the kind of the circled responses there, clusters of students actually saying because the show was educational or not, whether they, that was actually enjoyable for them. And then you see that start to tick over into the productive um, side of things. So yeah, the analysis is still going on. Uh, and if you're interested, you can contact me, contact me but um, I, I should have results, kind of, uh, full results by the end of my PhD in May. So thank you. All right, I think, uh, thank you, Alex. Um, Julieta is next. Is Julieta here? Yes, I am. Can you spotlight my screen, please? 
Thank you. Yeah, so um, I wanted to to talk about some word that you may be very familiar with, maybe not. But uh, today, because of uh, COVID, many shows are going to um, an online version of 360, which is a, a section of VR. So uh, this is a very important word, proprioception. Um, and I, I wanted to discuss proprioception aesthetics uh, because having exposed, having been exposed to it, uh, kind of primes all other media. It becomes an expectation from uh, from users to engage at that level. So if you have a cup of coffee or a cup of water next to you, can you uh, grab it and raise it in the camera? If you have something or a pencil nearby, so you grab it. Uh, and you didn't have to think much about it. You knew where it was in space. That is proprioception. And it is, uh, oops. It is an important aspect of VR. It is knowing where things are in relation to your body. So it is a different uh, concept than uh, kinesthetics, for example, which is the, uh, the feeling of movement. Uh, proprioception is knowing where things are in relation to you. And of course, that is very important in planetariums because we want to know where we are in space. Um, so there are two main ways that in VR you uh, proprioceptively engage. One is uh, through a stereoscopy where you know when you see in a stereo where things are in that close to you. So. Uh, what happens is whenever you see something in a stereo, you know it is that close. It, it is in that range of, of closeness. And of course, when you move in a space a little bit, uh, you, you see bigger objects, you know, you, because of motion parallax, you know where things are because of you moving and comparing those views. So if you move around a planet Earth that is about your size, uh, you know how much to move to see a different continent if you were to walk around, for example. Um, so, uh, VR is the first the redefinition of perspective since the Renaissance, according to Dan Sandin. And that uh, Renaissance version of, of uh, perspective is having that fixed point. But what happened with VR is you don't have a fixed point anymore. You walk around and you know where things are in space because of how you navigate and because of seeing things from the point of view of both eyes. So what happened uh, over and over in the lab and other when I worked there was this uh, sense that when people were exposed to the 3D screen and the Oculus and whatnot, uh, they would uh, see things um, they would go and look at flat screens and they would see them with a much deeper sense of a space. So here I am in uh, the universe sandbox and you see I'm touching the moon, I'm seeing it in a stereo and I know exactly how far it is from my body. And here I'm uh, throwing some moons at the earth and that physical sense of moving those, those objects and using physical force to move forward and speed things up uh, is something that is engaging that sense of the body. Of course, uh, the other day I talked about uh, the senses. We have like 30 senses. It's not just five senses that, that we have. And that is uh, something that we have to keep in mind that our senses are stuck together because of how we learn. They are not, we are not purely visual. When we see something, we engage all the senses with it. So that happens with having been exposed to proprioception in media, that now being in media, you understand more about it uh, and you expect more. You expect to be engaged at that, uh, at that level. Um, so here's a piece I wanted to show you. That, Enoel Kawano at the University of Hawaii made uh, a few years back. 
And it is basically throwing particles into a black hole, being able to move around the black hole. And I want you to think of that proprioceptively engaged experience where you are applying force to these particles to move forward. And then you are learning more about this, the dynamics in the, in the black hole. So uh, by having these expectations and these uh, levels of engagement, uh, I want you to think how people go back to planetariums where there's no proprioception per se, uh, yet there is an expectation and there are things that one can do to kind of recover that sense. Um, so we know that in, in planetarium domes, there's the primarily motion parallax to engage proprioception where you will move around objects. So it is not like the INS video where you just zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, and saw everything flat. But when we are in the planetarium, we want to move, you know, from a galaxy, look at it a little bit from the side, then move to the cosmic web, look at it from the side. And that gives you an idea before and after kind of parallel, kind of suggesting proprioception, like you are the one moving. Um, so that uh, aesthetics uh, allows us to understand these dynamics better and that in the space there are forces at work that are slightly different. So showing this before and after or at different speeds uh, or around kind of engage that sense and aesthetically our bodies in a much richer manner. Um, and uh, I think that's the point I wanted to make. We're going to move, we're going to keep moving and eventually we'll have shows offered online where the environment responds to the user in, in some way. Um, and in that regard, we need to leave the aesthetic assumptions of pre-tracking, that is before this level of propensity engagement behind. So thank you. All right, um, Barry, are you ready? Let me switch to you. Okay, give, give me a moment, share screen. All right, is the screen visible? We see your PowerPoint interface. Okay. There you go. All right. So I'm going to tell you a story that begins in 1989, when I first encountered the astronomy observatories built in India in the early 1700s by Maharaja Jai Singh. The Jantar Mantars, as they came to be called, are based on naked eye sky observation, and they comprise multiple structures of unique design many of which are massive in scale. When I first encountered them, I was in awe, literally took my breath away. As a photographer, I was enamored of the observatories. Their geometric forms provided rich material for abstract compositions of light, form, and texture. That first immersive experience of being within the instruments that measured the night sky stayed with me. And in 2001 and 2004, I returned to the Jantar Mantars making spherical panoramas and launching a website to bring the observatories to the attention of a world audience. In 2005, I presented a selection of panoramas at the Gates Planetarium in Denver, which gave me my first taste of an immersive place rendered inside an immersive space. And in 2010, I began a collaboration with Mark Subarau at the Adler Planetarium, leading to a lecture inside the Granger Sky Theater, incorporating live music and a sequence of panoramas and 3D models to move the audience from place to place within the observatory. At the same time that I was learning about the Dome Theater and its power as an immersive space, I was developing a book about the Jantar Mantars that would incorporate the photography I had done there. 
The hours spent in conversations with Mark and my experience in the Dome Theatre informed the approach I took in the design of the book and the decision to devote a major portion to immersive experience. We know that books can be immersive in the sense of storytelling, capturing our imagination and fascination with a character or plot, but how does a book become immersive in the sense of visual experience? Since the beginning of my work with spherical panoramas, I've made equirectangular projections and presented them in the form of exhibition prints. To many, they're at first glance disorienting and exotic because of their inherent distortion. But longer time spent with them leads to the discovery that one can learn to translate the image mentally into a seamless sweeping space that brings one in. The concept became the anchor for the immersion section of Celestial Mirror, which teaches readers how to understand the equirectangular rendering before presenting 26 panoramas in full page spreads. The book is comfortably sized to be able to be held close, affording a more immersive experience, and the detail in color along with the tactility of the page and the experience of holding the image help to intensify the experience. So my point in titling the story Thinking Outside the Dome is that there may be opportunities to amplify a presentation or a project by, uh, in the dome by utilizing adjacent spaces for exhibition or creating parallels in other media. And I'll just add um, that the book came out just at the beginning of July. <clears throat>